<laughs> July 23rd, 2018, a volcano erupts in the big island of Hawaii. 37 homes destroyed and 2,000 people displaced. August 18, 2018, a monsoon hits Kerala, India. 300 people killed, 85K people displaced. August 2018, the Mendocino Fire Complex. 450,000 homes destroyed, lands burned down. Trump zero tolerance policy. Thousands of children separated from their families. August 2018, Nia Wilson. She was only 18 years old when she was murdered at BART here in the Bay Area by a white supremacist. In all these social media news feed that we see on Facebook, that we see on Instagram, that comes up every single day. <sighs> I don't know about you all, but that was a lot to take in. And this is just what has happened during the summer. And there, this is just a couple of events to highlight. There's so much more that has happened over the last couple of weeks. Mass shootings, natural disasters, more children separated from their families, so much more. And I can't help but think that sometimes I don't want to watch the news. I don't want to go on my Facebook. How many people in here feel that? Yeah, I totally avoid the news sometimes. And the reason why I avoid it, I think, is because it reminds me of what could happen to me. As a human being, it's been difficult to feel safe in my body, to feel safe in my spaces where I typically feel safe in, whether that be at work, the classrooms, the playground, anywhere. It just doesn't feel safe nowadays. August 20th, 2018, we welcomed 33,000 students here at San Jose State University. So again, as uh, Darian mentioned, I am a department manager of Associate Students Cesar Chavez Kmiatin Center. I am a student affairs professional. Shout out to all the other student affairs professionals out there. Woot woot. Um, and when I came into the field, I came in particularly um, to make sure that I was providing a space for students to think critically, but also a space for them to feel brave in. But over these last couple of years, because it's been a long couple of years, let's be real, I have been wondering how the world is grappling with, how the, with what's been going on with the world. And even, and one of the things that I've learned about being in this field is that my students aren't just students. My students are whole people. They come in with multiple identities. They come in with hobbies. They come in with things that they love. Um, and with all of that in mind, they come in with their hearts heavy too, just like me. And so as a college administrator, I'm constantly thinking about what can I do to make it better for them? But more broadly, what can I do as a leader to make sure that we're taking care of each other. So it begged me the question, how do we lead during contentious times? So I thought long and hard about it. I was like, okay, what is one thing that we could do to make sure that the world is a better place? And I think I got it. I think we can lead the world to a better place using compassion. And I know what you are thinking, how is this groundbreaking, Diana? But let's be real, if people use compassion a little bit more, I don't think we'd be where we're at today. And I know what you're all thinking, you're probably thinking that this is compassion, people on the grass holding hands, skipping along, Teletubbies. But compassion is much more than that. And so I went on Google, because Google is also my best friend, <laughs> and I looked up the word to define the word, and this is what popped up. Compassion, noun the sympathetic consciousness of others' distress together with the desire to alleviate it. What a beautiful definition. It's definitely not people holding hands on the grass and it's definitely not Teletubbies. Um, but the definition is so powerful in itself. 
So let's break this definition down even more. The sympathetic consciousness of others' distress. So being mindfully conscious of how people are feeling and why people are hurting together. So it's not just thinking about someone, it's together with the desire to alleviate it. The desire to alleviate it means being able to give people the freedom, being able to heal people from what, whatever that is they are feeling. So when we think about compassion, it's just more than feeling for someone, it's actually doing something for someone. Um, and so that's a lot to process, right? So how do we practice compassion? And so in my own um, leadership and in, in my own practice as a scholar practitioner, I thought about what if we just use compassionate leadership? Um, and so providing three strategies to lead with the heart during contentious times, because that's what we're really doing here is we're leading with the heart. So the first strategy is knowledge. And no, I'm not talking about facts and data and numbers. I'm talking about being able to understand your heart. So being able to understand what hurts you, what hurts other people, but also being able to understand what brings joy to your heart and what brings joy to other people's heart. And so um, in this case, so this photo of this, of the, of this two-year-old Honduran asylum seeker went viral, right? We saw this photo everywhere on social media, on the news, and it struck the heart of so many Americans. And I kid you not, there's people who I thought didn't even like, who were so anti-immigration, became pro-immigration. And I was like, what? What is happening? You, you didn't, you were so xenophobic, and now you're like, now you're raising money um, to make sure that folks were taken care of. So I began to really think about why people were, why people were so, in, why people were so compassionate when it came to this photo and to what was going on. And so I thought, and I know I said I wasn't going to talk about data and numbers and scholarship, but I kind of had to because I'm an academic. And so one of my favorite um, scholars and theorists is Bell Hooks. And one of the things that she said is, I came to theory because I was hurting. And to highlight even more, um, just to kind of bring it down, I saw in theory then a location for healing. Um, and so I'm exactly that. I'm the geek that will read books to identify whatever that is that I'm feeling. And um, over the last couple of years, I was very privileged to be able to do that with my colleagues, um, Olivia Muniz and Chaz Lamar. Um, and we came up with this really cool terminology called community tragedy. So community tragedy is essentially an event that causes great suffering, destruction, distress on a specific affinity group. In definition, community tragedy is an event that can impact communities regardless of geographical location. Aristotle states that tragedy creates a cause and effect chain that clearly reveals what may happen at any time or place because that, because that is the, world, the way the world operates. Tragedy, therefore, arouses not only pity but also fear because one can envision themselves within this cause and effect chain. So the effects of community tragedy, intense emotions and reactivity, numbness and denial, depression, flashbacks, avoidance, performance, and sometimes avoiding the news and avoiding conversations. So coming back to this photo, this photo that went viral over the summer, I think it's safe to say that each and every single one of us here has a child that we deeply love and care about, right? Am I right? We have a child that we love so much. And so in thinking about this photo, for us, we look at this child and we see that child that we love and care about so much. And we think about our relationship with that child. And so that's why, that's, that's an example of community tragedy, of being able to see yourself in those shoes because at any point, that child that you love, that you once cared about, could be taken away. So the second strategy that I propose is a strategy of vulnerability. So in addition to being a department manager here at the, C at the Cesar Chavez Community Action Center, I'm also a yoga instructor because, you know, if you live in the Bay Area and you're single, like, 
it's virtually impossible to like live by yourself. So you have to have a second hustle. So yeah, so I'm a yoga instructor. <laughs> and one of my favorite postures as a yoga instructor is this pose called ca uh, camel's pose. And I tell my students all the time that camel pose is the biggest, deep, biggest heart opener of class because it is, because it is. And we often don't open our hearts physically this way. Um, and so I tell my students too that when we physically open our hearts in that way, a lot of things come up. A lot of things that you wouldn't think would come up comes up, um, whether that be physically or emotionally. Um, and so vulnerability works in that way, exactly. When we open our hearts, it brings up thoughts, feelings that we wouldn't imagine happening. And so Brene Brown states vulnerability really clearly. The courage to be vulnerable, to show up and be seen, to ask for what you need, to talk about how you've been feeling, to have those hard conversations, to show up and be seen. How many times have we told people to stop crying? Sometimes we tell ourselves to stop crying because it's unprofessional or we don't want to be seen as not manly enough. But what if we just allowed people to show up and be seen in their real emotions? to have those hard conversations. I don't think we have those hard conversations enough. We need to have those hard conversations. If we're talking about change, if we're talking about alleviating pain from other people's lives, we have to have those hard conversations. And sometimes it's with family. And so an example of vulnerability for me is, was, was when um, the murder of Nia Wilson happened. Nia Wilson was only 18 years old. Nia Wilson could have been my student. Nia Wilson could have been my friend. Nia Wilson could have been a colleague. She could have been someone that I loved. And she was for many people. And so when I found out about the murder of Nia Wilson, I was so pissed off because it was something that happened here in the Bay Area. How can an area so diverse be so racist at the same time? And so, Showing vulnerability to me meant having those hard, make, having those hard conversations with my family members, having those hard conversations with my friends about anti-blackness, because this is where the core is, is anti-blackness. And it was important for me to show up and to have those hard conversations with them. And the last strategy that I share with you is action. Because again, going back to the def definition of compassion is the desire to alleviate it. So that means action. And compassion feels and looks differently on everyone because we're all different human beings and we are all passionate about something. So compassion could look like protests. It could look like rallies. It could look like writing. It could look like donations. It could look like art. It could look like music. It could look like advocacy. And for me, how I practice compassion is being able to provide spaces for my students to have these hard conversations and to be vulnerable with them too. It means being able to provide a space for my students to grow vegetables for students that are facing food insecurity. It means for me doing yoga because you have to take care of yourself in that process. And it means family and being able to spend that time with my family and have those hard conversations. So what can leading with compassion look like for you? I don't know. I don't know what your passion is. But whatever it is, I hope that you do what matters to you. I hope you do what matters to the people around you. And I hope that you do it with love. Because at the end of the day, compassion, going back to alleviating someone's pain, is a part of the healing process. And I would say that healing work is a lot. It's a lot to take on. It's a lot. And sometimes you'll mess up. And sometimes you'll do really great in it. And so as you all are practicing compassion, I offer you one more thing. Give yourself compassion. And in that work of compassion, are you willing to give yourself forgiveness 
grace, joy, happiness, empathy, presence, a space to grieve, a space to feel frustrated and angry, a space to heal, a space to feel happy. So at the end of the day, I will often tell my, ask my students, so what, now what? So I propose to you all, and it's very simple, just do it, because the world needs more of it. And before I close out, again, because compassion work can be really hard and challenging, one of my favorite scholars and activists is Grace Lee Boggs, and I always come back to this quote. Love isn't about what we did yesterday. It's about what we do today and what we do tomorrow and the day after that. Thank you all. Thank you.